Massis Foundation. Daily podcast from Onassis, LA, and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Is this Nicholas Begruen? Yes, it is. Hello, Nicholas. Oh, how are you? I am well. I'm alive. Um, it's quite. It's these times are so dire and delirious and tremendous um, that answering that simple question is complicated. How are you doing? Uh, luckily, fine. Uh, and I should. Are all the adjectives you? You just came up with. They're all good. Tell me, what what does your quarantine look like? Well, you would think that uh, you know, at a time when, in my case, I'm quite lucky uh, because I can be confined compared to many others who, frankly, you know, have to work uh, to help us and protect us. So in my case, I can actually be confined, you would think that um, you get uh, to maybe do less. Um, In my case, I think it's the opposite. I think the mind never rests. And if you're interested in uh, ideas and work on ideas, which is what I do and what the Institute does, uh, you actually uh, are more active. Not less. I, f- I find that uh, to be the case for myself very much now, though I find it very difficult um, to sustain a, a level of attention because the, the world seems to be so present and distracts us from sustained attention. I should say to our listeners that I'm speaking with Nicholas Begruen, who runs uh, the Begruen Institute, and I would very much like you to tell our listeners what what the goal of the Big Ruin Institute is. And I might say what the goal was until the Ides of March or thereabout. And perhaps if there has been a change between the before uh, the virus and the after in terms of your priorities. Well, I don't want to bore your listeners, but uh, a few words. Uh, the Institute was founded now some 10 years ago. We have on purpose two centers, one in Los Angeles and the other one in Beijing. So if you want almost the opposite culturally and politically uh, on purpose. And we work on big questions uh, around democracy, around capitalism, around geopolitics, and the future of the human. Who with technologies such as AI and gene editing, who do we want to be as humans? And um, we do this with scholars and thinkers who work at the Institute, but we also work with people around the world who uh, we think have ideas and you know, things to say. So our work is really around developing ideas and then in some cases implementing those. You know, with regards to what are we doing today that's different uh, than, let's say, a couple of months ago, or even, uh, a, or even a couple of weeks ago. Well, I have to say, because of our center in China, we we saw what was happening. Right. And um, and uh, everybody in our center in China started working um, off-site already two months ago. So we we saw it, and we started this actually in, in Los Angeles uh, maybe a month ago. And uh, frankly it sort of falls in all the uh, questions 
in essence, the remit of the Institute, which is uh, governance, meaning uh, which form of government and governance uh, handle this kind of crisis better than others. And we see a little bit around the world who's prepared, who's not. And uh, this reinforces our idea that uh, governance and capacity of government is really, really important, makes an enormous difference. That's number one. Number two, at a time when everybody is sort of self-isolating, actually cooperation is even more important than ever. That uh, addresses sort of our work around geopolitics. So in a world that's splintering, this was you know before the virus, uh, now even more so. Uh, on the other hand, you need more cooperation than ever around uh, medical data and um, and you can see that the world, uh, no matter how much you isolate at the end, you can't stop uh, something that uh, is uh, uh, around uh, nature or health. So all the issues that existed before, like climate, like health, like technology and security and uh, economics, uh, are really worldwide phenomenon. You cannot really isolate them. And that takes it to another aspect of what we do, which is uh, uh, economics and capitalism. I mean, we see that certain uh, environments are going to be better at um, uh, sustaining their citizens and some uh, the inequality and the uh, difficulties of some will only uh, get worse unless uh, this may be uh, the sort of the start of a, of a sort of new thinking around capabilities for, for everyone. And we've been working on something that we call pre-distribution as opposed to redistribution, meaning um, every citizen with a um, uh, stake in the economy as opposed to redistribution through taxes or, frankly, um, uh, you know, direct government um, handouts. So our feeling is that the crisis in a, in a, I would say, in a very strong way, in a, um, a violent way, uh, sort of, you know, address or, or let's say puts in front of us uh, a question for every one of the main themes that we work on. I had occasion very recently to speak with the philosopher Simon Critchley, who, who said that this moment, this moment of this pandemic, is a philosophical moment. It's a moment that puts us in front of questions, questions of power, questions of inequality, and quite frankly, questions of capitalism and democracy. Do you, do you feel... Um, that, that Simon's comment there is correct? And in what way do you think it may have highlighted certain questions and certain predicaments, particularly of capitalism, that perhaps need to be revisited in a different way? I think he's right. I think that this forces the entire world to, in essence, take a step back and to not only deal with the crisis at hand, but also to see how can we do better in the future and who do we want to be you know, in a future that will have these kinds of challenges and we see it more and more, these challenges are global. So um, how do we want to, as people... How can we humans, do better? How can we do better? Nicholas, exactly. how can we do better? How can we do well, we better and how can an institute like the Big Ruin Institute help us understand what perhaps what the priorities need to be or how priorities need to shift, how perhaps we need to shift, perhaps there's a paradigm shift. Um, and, and are there people in your institute who are really thinking about that? And I'm thinking particularly also about your relationship with China, uh, since I think this pandemic might highlight certain tensions that exist between 
let's say, the United States and China? Well, interestingly enough, I think the answer is both at the micro level and at the macro level, meaning it's at the level of each human, each citizen, you have to arm them with more or with better. That means, um, you know, certain social and economic minimums, access, and the ability to integrate from an information standpoint into a greater world. That's at the individual level. But at the macro level, you also need uh, governance and government that can be better for citizens. So it's sort of both sides. And you need at the international level, but also at the national level, you need uh, cooperation and sharing of information to be better to serve citizens. So it's both uh, at the uh, very personal level and at the uh, global level, because some of these issues like health, like security, like uh, economics, like climate, can only be dealt with at a very macro level. So you need to address both. And that's what's so interesting about this crisis, because it shows that you cannot just have an answer that's local, and you cannot have an answer that's, you know, global, but doesn't touch uh, people at the local level. You need both. Nicholas, I want to take you back to your childhood. Um, I want to take you back to the country house where you vacationed as a child, where you would, in 12-hour spurts, um, be surrounded by stuffed animals and books. And one such book that I think touched you deeply was Les Trois Mousquetaires, The Three Musketeers. And you asked yourself in those years, I don't know how young you were at that point, but you asked yourself, why does power rest not with the king, but with a shadow government? No one, you said, had the answer. And I'm wondering, in a sense, isn't that still true about shadow governments now? And isn't that one of the major problems with our democracy? Well, my God, that's an interesting personal uh, fact. It is true that I did spend a lot of time in Normandy uh, where there wasn't much to do except watch the rain, think, and uh, read and write. And fr frankly, I'm lucky now because I'm in Los Angeles where it's sunny, but with this quarantine, it's about the same. So think, read, write, and work. Um, it's a lot better today than when I was little because now I know a little bit what I want to do. Um, in terms of, yeah, Eminence Grise, that's the French uh, yes. word, yes. The, the power behind the power. And yeah. that was the case uh, under two French kings, uh, Louis XIII, where the uh, power uh, was uh, Richelieu, and Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, when he was little, uh, you had uh, a, a cardinal called Mazarin, yeah. uh, who was the shadow power. I think that, uh, well, yes, it exists when the, the power, the official power, uh, isn't that strong or uh, that able. And that was the case of Louis XIII, and that was the case certainly of Louis XIV when he was a child. But uh, as he... Uh, became an adult and he was a very able um, leader uh, well he took control so I think it has to do with um, how able are the people who are uh, leaders I actually think that today most leaders um, are, who, and it's interesting a lot of leaders in democracies and in autocracies today are quite strong and I wouldn't say that uh, they are being manipulated by a shadow government. They're quite strong, and um, you could say they're good or not good, but they're clearly in charge and clearly in power. I think it's actually quite unusual that at a time when, in theory, uh, information and voices are highly, highly distributed, 
how much power is in the um, hands of actually the people who are the heads of government. I mean, Trump is clearly running things here. Uh, Modi is running things in India. Putin is running things in Russia. She is running things in China. And equivalent, frankly, in places like Brazil. And even in Europe, the few leaders who seem to have a certain degree of authority are quite strong. Uh, sometimes popular, sometimes not. But look at Macron. So I would say, actually, uh, the ones who are um, strong are there for them. I mean, they're there as themselves. They're not representing uh, someone else. Literature, as as we say, how old were you when you read Les Trois Mousquetaires, that passage that I of reminiscence which was quite personal and I hope didn't disturb you? Um, how old were you when you when you were ruminating on shadow power? I can't remember, but I was quite young. I probably was way over my head, probably around <sighs> 10, 11, something like that. So so literature, in, in a way, um, and it's an interesting phenomenon now, just the, the extraordinary sp uh, place, space that literature is taking in these quarantine moments. You probably know that uh, La Peste of Camus has sold tens of thousands of copies in Italy and in France and elsewhere. People are reading Boccaccio, people are reading Saramago, people are turning to literature uh, to, to, to search maybe uh, for comfort in one way, for answers in another way. What are you turning to at this moment, Nicholas? What, what, uh, what are you reading? Well, and the, first, the, the first instinct was a little bit similar. So I did look up some of the things I did read, like, as you say, La Peste by Camus. But uh, now that I have a little bit more time, I'm reading um, uh, actually a lot of Eastern texts, um, Indian, uh, Chinese, because I just feel that um, uh, they can teach us quite a lot, uh, meaning that they are much more interested in the whole and in the health of the whole than just the individual. And I think that if you look at Western literature, you mentioned Camus, Camus or Sartre, who influenced me a lot when I was young, uh, are all uh, focused on the individual. And the individual, I think, gets quite lonely in this environment. Mm. And if you look at things, in a more holistic way, I think you find better answers. I had occasion to speak to one of the very greatest publishers in the world, Naveen Kishore, who publishes out of Calcutta, and he spoke very much in, in, in ways uh, similar to what you're talking about now, which is really to look at a, a, a more holistic idea of, of, of the individual, not one that is just based on um, the isolation, actually, that people are feeling more and more now. And I'm, you know, one of the distinctive uh, endeavors of, of the Institute has been this philosophy prize that you give every year uh, to a philosopher of, uh, uh, of who's uh, important. And I'm wondering, in, in terms of the Institute at this point, are there are there people on your on your committees who are looking at some of the issues that you brought about, whether it's capitalism, whether it is democracy, are thinking about the ethical implications of what is happening right now with this virus, and if so, in what way? Well, the jury of the prize uh, has, interestingly enough. No, people who are in New York, but also uh, Elif Shafak, who is a uh, Turkish. Turkish novelist and uh, a Chinese philosopher. So we've got on purpose an, a group that uh, thinks in different ways. And I think they're addressing some of these issues from their own culture and from their own uh, ethical inquiries. 
we're going to get contributions from many of them, uh, which we will publish in the new publication, which we're launching called Noema. And um, it's interesting because, yes, I think the answers we'll get from them are going to be a little different than just uh, day-to-day reactions, which are normal. But the day-to-day reactions uh, to the virus itself, they're going to be, you know, longer term about how does this affect uh, humanity and the way uh, we function. And we'll see. Um, it's early days, and I'm sorry not to give you a, a great answer here, but I think the, my speculation would be the answer is going to be more about uh, community than, again, about the individual. You you wrote um, in the early days, I don't know if you wrote, but your, your institute came up with some... Um, coronavirus lessons. I think that was in the very early days of the virus, you put onto paper uh, some of the lessons. And one of them in particular that I'd like you to expand on is you, you say we can no longer ignore that basic minimums for all need to be met. A social safety net that includes health care, access to services, and a stake in the economy. This is both to give everyone a chance to flourish and to protect them. A stake in the economy. I'd like you to to talk a little bit more about, about that because it seems that one of the th- effects of this virus is to show just the level of inequality of our society. So the, the idea here is actually quite simple. Capitalism has, well, conquered the world and has lifted, I would say, a huge portion of the world population. And uh, so that's very good. But it's done it in a way that's very unequal. And the inequalities are showcased in this environment even more. So some people have access, and not just to economic goods, but um, healthcare and other things. And the question is, how do you uh, give access to those who really don't have access? Right. And one way, that's a classical way, is simply, well, you tax the ones who make money and you redistribute. That's, number one, quite toxic. It's always a fight. It's um, also not that efficient. What about if everyone, as opposed to just being on one side of the uh, barrier or the other, if everyone had some stake in the uh, economy, some stake in the uh, success of you know a nation or a state, and um, uh, the idea is possible, I think, through savings plans or through, frankly, um, a stake, maybe a collective state stake, through something like a sovereign wealth fund, where everyone had a piece of what, you know, makes an economy productive. Uh, So we call this pre-distribution as opposed to universal basic income. It's really universal basic capital. So it's another way of trying to redistribute, but pre-distribute as opposed to redistribute. And I think uh, that's more powerful because everybody is on the same side of... um, Defense. Everybody wants everybody else to be successful, and everybody benefits from it. So I think it's much more empowering as opposed to uh, creating more division. Do you do you subscribe to the view of some now that the debts incurred, particularly by by students, should be forgiven? I mean, I think that very specific to. You know, it depends where where you are, meaning in the U.S. versus other countries. Yes. Um, I think that, you know, education personally, I think that education should be uh, sort of a public good for everyone. Right. The, then the question is, uh, how do you distribute this public good? Well, I think it should be free, yes. Uh, on the other hand, you've got to fund it. And the question is, how do you fund it? And in certain countries, you have so-called elite universities, 
uh, you have it in the US, you have it in the UK, you actually have it in China. And uh, the question is, how do you fund those? And are those beneficial? The meat university doesn't sound uh, good, but the reality is that they're incredibly good in terms of uh, producing uh, great ideas, great minds, um, great science. So you actually need them. So I think the, I'm not sure you can have a, a simple answer to all of this. Most continental European countries have very good university free for everyone, uh, but they've in great part uh, done away with so-called elite universities. And I think they've suffered from it. So I think you almost need both. And, um, and uh, the question is, how do you fund it? Now, I think rich places like the U.S. should be able to uh, give the entire population a chance uh, to have quality education. No reason why not. They can afford it. Nicholas, do you, do you think the world will look different after this virus passes and you know that may may take much longer than than we believe but let's assume that in six months time i'll be able to have a drink with you um, we won't need to have a drink six feet apart how will the world look differently and perhaps not only how but what are your hopes what are your hopes and what are your hopes personally and what are your hopes for the big ruin institute well, the hope is that it will address or forces us to address, hopefully, uh, some of the issues we talked about today, which is capacity of government, um, inequality, uh, sharing of uh, efforts and information at the global level to help everyone. These are, I think, the hopes. The question is, will this crisis and after this, you know, shock and pause, uh, will this crisis get us to do it? I'm on one side hopeful, on the other side, frankly, uh, skeptical, because uh, people in societies and cultures tend to revert to what they were even before mm. any crisis. Mm. And are they able to adapt? Are they able to... Um, change, adapt for sure, uh, really change, not so easy. Uh, people have always said you need a real crisis and it's a shame to waste the crisis and it would be a shame mm -hmm. not to uh, do something uh, because we, you know, the, the questions are clear and they're in front of us. Not doing something would be a shame. On the other hand, I look at what happens after war uh, people revert to the way they used to do things. There's sometimes um, a period of um, uh, cooperation and of rebuilding, and I think that will happen, and I think that's going to be um, hopefully very cooperative and positive. The question is, will people truly change? I don't know. Vera, we'll see what happens. I'm I'm hopeful in some way that and it's been said over, over the program now, which is two weeks old and not even quite, is that perhaps a greater kindness will emerge, uh, perhaps a greater caring. It's hard to know if that will be the case, but we can hope. Nicholas, it's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I hope that when this too passes, we'll have occasion to see each other in person. Well, I hope so, sooner rather than not. Yes. So, thank you again for thank, all these excellent questions. Uh, thank you very much and for taking program. my my call and and all the best to you and stay safe and at some point I want your reading list. Lovely. Looking forward. Bye bye. Bye bye Nicholas. Thank you. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com/support.